Hello, this is Professor Licato, so I hope your day is going well. In this segment, we are going to discuss whether an activity is a trade, business, or hobby, and more importantly, why we should care as tax preparers, tax professionals, um, tax planners. So let's dive in. To put this in the proper context and so you can see the importance of this topic, we're going to look at the rise of freelancing in our economy. Then we're going to look at the three options for deducting business type expenses. And in the meat of today's segment, the importance, why are we here? Why are we discussing this? The importance of being deemed a trader business. And then we'll look at the factors for determining if an activity is a hobby and those actually help us determine if it's a trader business. Then to apply what you've learned, I've come up with a uh, piece called You Be the Judge. And you're going to apply the factors to two court cases. I will apply them to the first one. You will then apply it to the second one. And then we'll discuss the safe harbor rule and then walk away from today's key takeaways as kind of a summary. As you can see here, 59 million Americans and more than one third of the US workforce participated in freelance work. Now, in your mind, you probably think of a freelancer as someone that probably sits around in their shorts or uh, pajamas and is drinking coffee and doing work from home. That may be the case, but they are hardworking just like anyone else. Some travel the world, some work 12 hours a day, some work two hours a day, some work seven days a week. But a freelancer is not just a pure freelancer, someone that devotes all their time to freelancing as their full-time gig, can also be someone that has a full-time job and does freelancing on the side. And we would want that activity to be deemed a trade or business, as we'll see shortly. What's interesting about this number you see on the screen, 36%, they are not completely accounted for in the workforce. So when we talk about unemployment or employment data, they are not necessarily included in that data. And so the Federal Reserve, which monitors interest rates, needs to adapt the way they collect their data because these individuals, which as you can see, drive our economy in many ways, uh, need to be accounted for more strongly. Well, there are three options for a taxpayer looking to deduct business type expenses. Section 162, which allows for deductions for ordinary and necessary expenses that are incurred during the taxable year in carrying on a trade or business. Section 212, which we're not going to go into detail uh, in this segment, relates to expenses for the production of income, passive income, like real estate, like rent. We are going to focus on Section 183. And if you engage in a hobby, it's deemed to be an activity that's not entered into for profit. Therefore, the taxpayer can only deduct the expenses incurred with that hobby up to the amount of income earned from that hobby. They cannot take a loss. And we'll revisit that shortly. So you want to definitely know these sections digest them, and then move forward to the next slide. So as you'll see here, Schedule C, and it is very critical um, or important that we fall on the schedule or are able to use this schedule. Now notice it says profit or loss from business, which means we want to be able to uh, take our income and any ordinary and necessary expenses we want to be able to list them out here on the form so that we can reduce our income, reduce our tax liability. That's going to be key. But if we are a hobby, we cannot take expenses in excess of our, in our income. If we are a trade or business, we can do that. So what constitutes a trade or business? Well, the Supreme Court has said the following. It is a case by case analysis but it is an activity pursued with a full-time good faith intention. Produce income uh, will usually qualify as a trade of business. Now notice, a full-time good faith intention. It does not necessarily mean that you have to participate in it 80 hours a week, 60 hours a week, 40 hours a week. Right? 
It could be something that you do alongside of a full-time job, but it becomes harder as we see some of the factors later that courts use to determine if something is a hobby or a business. It does become harder if you are not engaged in the activity full-time to have it deemed a trade or business. So keep that in mind. But notice the two requirements. The taxpayer must be involved in the activity with continuity and regularity, and the primary purpose for the taxpayer is to earn a profit. It's not just a mere saying of it, you have to demonstrate it, and I will show you how a taxpayer can demonstrate that. So when we look here, we've got a Grotzinger case, and it involves a gentleman that went to the Greyhound racetrack. He went every day. He studied the racing forms. He studied after the, the races. He would take copious notes. He would revise his strategies. He went every day. He would spend several hours at the track, several hours before getting ready, and then several hours afterwards doing more research. So he wanted to deduct his expenses against his income and be treated as a trader business and he had a loss he wanted to take the loss so we're going to hold off on concluding here whether or not mr grotzinger's situation rises to the level of a trader business because i want to be able to apply the factors first so we will do that as we go and then wrap up with this case so notice here that meeting the definition of a trader business under 162 became even more important when the top, uh, Tax Cut Jobs Act uh, was enacted. Because if you are a trader business, you're allowed what's called a QBI deduction. A Section 199A allows for a 20% deduction against qualified business income so long as that income was earned in a trader business as defined by section 162. Now I know in the more advanced course you will cover the QBI deduction and I believe we will touch upon it in this course as well. Section 1400Z-2 allows for a number of incentives for gains contributed to a qualified opportunity zone, but only if the taxpayer conducts a 162 trader business in the opportunity zone. So I bring that up just to show again the importance of being treated as a trader business. Now notice in the next one, business interest expense is now limited to 30% of taxable income, but this is only interest expense earned again in a trader business defined by section 162. Okay. Now notice rental expenses can be deducted whether you're a trader business or your 212 uh, production of income situation which is rent. Okay. So if you bring in rental income you can offset the rental expenses against that income. Well notice under section 162 if you're a trader business you can deduct under section 62A4 rental expenses. So you see the benefits and then go back to schedule C, okay, profit or loss for trade or business, you would itemize, detail out these expenses and offset them against the trade or business's income. Huge benefit. So now let's look at hobbies. They are activities not engaged for profit. And notice that's the super critical part, but it's not merely enough to say you're engaged in it for profit. So in this situation, the Internal Revenue Code allows individuals to deduct expenses which are incurred in a trader business or for the production of income or for the management, conservation, or maintenance of property held for the production of income. That's generally, right? That's what the code allows, but under section 183, it allows a deduction for a hobby only up to the income brought in by that hobby, i.e. you cannot take a loss. If you're a hobby, then most people who have hobbies are taking losses and they cannot deduct any excess 
of their expenses over their income coming from the hobby. So for example, someone that makes a crochet sweaters may sell them at a fair or a farmer's market. And they're realizing that they enjoy doing it, they, they love doing it, but they're not making a living out of it. Oh, that's something the IRS is very cognizant of, but they can only again deduct expenses up to the income they make. Well, here are the factors, and this is critical because this will also help us determine if we are a trade or business. So when we look at these factors, think about whether or not they would qualify for something being a trade or business. And I bolded numbers one, eight, and nine, because that is what the tax court and federal courts look at the most. They put the most weight in those factors. Number one, the manner in which the taxpayer carries on the activity. Okay? Some of the underlying ones, two through seven, help support this. But as an example, do they keep good records? Isn't it enough though to keep good financial records like a general ledger? What are they doing with that information? Are they revisiting it and looking at it at a daily, weekly, monthly basis to improve their business, to earn a profit? So it's not just enough to keep good records. Did they seek the advice of an expert? So for example, I work with artisan designers and I help them create what's called a freelance business activity model. And it is similar to a business model, but more in depth and more tailored to a freelancer, even as a work batch schedule where they have to demonstrate each week, what are they working on? I also show them how to keep their invoices, how to keep their books, how to obtain clients, uh, how to manage clients, how to devote time to their craft, where in their home are they gonna have a studio, are they gonna have it in the garage, how much of that can they can deduct, which is covered in a different part of the course, um, but really showing in concrete format that they are in it to make a profit because they sought the expert uh, advice of a professional. Number three, the time and effort expended by the taxpayer in carrying on the activity. Again, that goes to, is it full time? Is it five hours a week? The more they're devoted to it, that leans more towards it being a trade or business. As I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be full time, but it's better if it is. That would give this factor more weight. Number four, expectation that assets used in the activity may appreciate in value. Well, that's important, um, such as did they buy a building, which is probably not going to be the case for someone who's freelancing. Um, it could be something like um, a piece of equipment that normally would depreciate, but when we say appreciate and value here, we could look at it from this standpoint. Is it adding value to the business? Meaning by getting a laser printer, were they able to go from selling 10 items to 1,000 or 100? So that shows that it's helping improve the value of the business. Number five, the success of the taxpayer in carrying on other similar or dissimilar activities. So if the person seasoned and has done this before, has learned from it and has shown improvements uh, and is closer to a profit or earning a profit. Number six, the taxpayer's history of income or losses with respect to the activity. So have they suffered losses for several years or in the past five years? We'll get to a rebuttable presumption later. If out of three out of five years, they earned a profit. So star that, we'll get to that one in a little bit. Number seven, the amount of occasional profits, if any, which are earned, that's a good sign. The more it happens, the better. The financial status of the taxpayer is this their bread and butter or is this something that's like a small portion of their income? Is it clearly that they don't need this to make a living? Okay. 
And then number nine, elements of personal pleasure or recreation. Is it done for the pure enjoyment of it? Or is it, is it a labor of love, as the courts like to say? That actually hurts the taxpayer. It makes it more a hobby than a trade or business. But seeing there, no one factor is determinative because of course, if you're gonna engage in something and put that much time into it, you have to love it, right? We would hope, and that's one uh, personal lesson from today. Be sure to pursue things in life that you're passionate about. And if tax is something you're passionate about, keep going because it is a very rewarding career because all things in life really tie back to good tax planning. So keep that in mind. So let's dive in a little bit more when we look at section 183. The focus is whether the activity is engaged in for profit, just to hit that, that home, trying to earn a profit, rather whether it is carried out uh, with a reasonable expectation of profit. So you're actually trying to make a profit. And it is a facts and circumstances test as shown on the previous slide. Those are your factors and it's case by case analysis. Okay? Whether an activity is engaged in for profit is an objective test, which means we're going to apply a reasonable person standard. It's not based on one person. It's based on if you took 100 people, 80 of them would say, yes, that's a reasonable person standard. Here are some red flags, which I've alluded to a little bit already. Um, are there large expenses and little or no income? If that's the case, uh, the IRS is gonna flag this for being a hobby. Are the losses offsetting other income on the return, which means it makes it appear more like a tax shelter to try to reduce income from other sources? Does the activity result in a large tax benefit to the taxpayer again, uh, feeling more like uh, a tax shelter type situation. Does the history of the activity show that it is generating profit in any years? That's a, that's a positive if it is. Are there significant elements of personal pleasure and recre recreation that, that actually hurts the taxpayer? But again, not 100% because it's, of course, it's something the taxpayer is gonna to wanna to enjoy and love. So here are some activities that are susceptible to review under this section where the IRS uh, tends to view them as hobbies such as fishing, horse racing, horse breeding. Uh, and I was surprised to find when I gave a presentation similar to this uh, earlier in the year uh, to a fairly large audience, how many in the audience were involved in horse breeding, uh, farming, motocross racing, you can see them all there, dog breeding, riding, entertainers, notice artists. And that's why I'm uh, very passionate about this topic because I help artists and writers and entertainers and designers, uh, video game designers, for example. Uh, I, I'm very interested in helping them because they bring a lot um, to the culture of our country and they, they are a big part of our economy. Photographers, as another example, I just worked with a photographer who loves to write, so we combined both activities and he created a wonderful business. He travels to different parts of the world and so he adds writing to the photography and helps tell the story. So it's kind of cool. So if you're looking for an opportunity like that to, to help others, Certainly that's there with your, the knowledge you're gaining as a, a tax professional. So again, here are the uh, factors again, just as a review, so they're, they're fresh because we're going to apply them now. And so what must be shown to satisfy each of these factors? So there's a nice list there. This slide I put together for your benefit. I will post these slides uh, for you. And You'll have these as notes, but notice um, in the first one, the manner in which the taxpayer conducts the activity. Well, notice the second bullet, maintaining complete and accurate books and records. And as I said before, you have to show you're using them. It's not enough just to keep them. They can't collect dust, right? Um, you have to use them to make your business better, to make it more efficient. And so if you look at all these, they're just, uh, a nice smorgasbord of 
ways to demonstrate that you are not a hobby, that you are a trade or business. Um, so take a look at those and uh, we've already kind of alluded to most of them. What I want to do now is take all these factors and apply them to some cases. So this screen will make a lot of sense for you. This will be your cheat sheet. If you want, I suggest you might want to just print out this one slide or have it available for you up on your desktop. So case number one, it's story versus commissioner. This is an actual case. Taxpayer was a partner in a law firm. Don't hold that against him. Uh, and an accomplished attorney. And actually, he's a she. And in 2003, because she had a strong interest in filmmaking, she took a sabbatical to attend the New York Academy's one month filmmaking program and learn the technical aspect of filmmaking and meet people in the industry. At that time, her husband had once been in Up With The People. So I had it flipped. I thought the husband was the filmmaker and lawyer, and it's, it's actually the wife. Well, and that's important because the IRS challenged this a little bit because the wife's husband had an interest in this area and they started to think, well, is this a more personal thing for her? Was this a labor of love? Well, there's, was there personal motivation behind this? So they looked at that relationship between the two and you'll see why. So this was a, uh, a musical ensemble that used to play Super Bowl uh, halftime shows before America turned into uh, comically a hedonistic wasteland. Um, she negotiated all the rights to the Up With People footage and set out to make a documentary about the group. She worked nights and weekends and did over 400 hours of interviews. 400 hours of interviews. She was, notice the emphasis there that I gave. That shows that commitment, right? She was going to leave her husband out of it, but an executive producer convinced her to put him in. Now, when you look at the factors from the prior slide that I brought up, you will see that we are, we are actually fleshing those bullet points under each factor with these facts. Um, in 2005, she formed a single member LLC to produce the film. She established a checking account, a savings account, and a credit card for the LLC. Sounds to me that's satisfying, number one, the manner in which she is um, conducting the activity. Right? Sorry, I had to let uh, a fire engine go by in an ambulance so you could tell them in the city. And in 2006, so again, going back to 2005, she sets up an LLC, she sets up a savings account, uh, a credit card, a checking account, sound pretty, sounding pretty legit to me. 2006, she produced a trailer that played at Sundance and the film was a change based on the reactions. Um, and she also created a business plan and written budgets. She sought investments and obtained loans when the, the funds fell through. She hired a bookkeeper to manage the finances and an accounting firm to manage certain tax matters, seeking the help of experts. She set up a website, but changed the name of the site in the movie when search terms used to find the site were leading to, to bad things. In 2009, she began actively marketing the film and she and the film began to earn awards. She sought the advice of industry experts, including former Academy Award winners, at the time of trial, now several years later, 2012, she owned all the rights to the film. They planned to sell DVDs for $20 and educational DVDs for $200 to $250. For 2006 through 2008, the IRS disallowed her expenses. They contended that it was a hobby, a labor of love, with no intention of making a profit. Therefore, the expenses were limited to her income. Well, let's apply these factors because she appealed the IRS's viewpoint, their ruling. And so you can see that factors one, two, three, and five were in her favor. The factor four was neutral, 
Factors six and seven were neutral, but four was slightly in her favor. And then in favor of the IRS was eight and nine, the labor of love, right? Um, but that wasn't detrimental necessarily, right? It wasn't necessarily uh, the, the defining moment because she did all those things in factors one, two, and three, and five, particularly number one. So remember when I highlighted um, before on that one screen, factor number one, the manner in which she is conducting this activity. And there you have it. Um, and notice that one of the key takeaways that I noted there, the taxpayer can be engaged in more than one business at a time. So you can have more than one trader business. It's just got to satisfy these factors. So the court concluded that this was in fact a trader business. So after digesting this and processing it, we're going to now have you apply the situation here. I'm not going to be overly excited about any one factor or, or anything right now. I'm going to let you go through the facts. So this is the Wilmot case. And the taxpayer was an oceanographer. That's what he did for a living. He worked for the NOAA and taught at Johns Hopkins. Okay? In 2001, he began taking photography courses and started a photography business in his mind. In 2002, remember you want to apply the factors as we go through this. Is this a hobby or is it feel more like a trade or business? And you want to consider all nine factors. So again, in 2002, he began reporting the expenses on his tax return. Well, is it enough that he just does that because he thinks he can? In 2004, he worked full time at the NOAA because that's his gig and for Johns Hopkins and earned 120,000, not too shabby. That year, he made three trips to Europe to take photos and build a portfolio. A photographer friend helped facilitate the shoots, provided models, makeup artists, etc. In 2006, he earned a degree in photography. Awesome. On his 2004 tax return, he deducted $57,000 of photography expenses as business expenses for his trip to Europe. He had no income. Hmm. So the whole trip to Europe. He kept binders uh, to substantiate his expenses. Good. Receipts, invoices, ticket stubs, bank statements, credit card statements, etc. He kept handwritten work papers for his tax return that did not tie to the binders. The IRS denied the 2004 expenses, contending the activity was a hobby. Do you agree? So before you go to the next slide, work through the factors yourself and come up with a conclusion and see how you did. The key is, can you explain your conclusion by applying the factors? So when we now look here, um, the tax court has indicated that the predominant purpose should be making a profit. While the Fourth Circuit said all that is required is that the taxpayer has a purpose of making a profit, but it does not need to be the taxpayer's predominant purpose. So with the oceanographer, was he trying to make a profit? Was it his predominant purpose? Um, notice in the Supreme Court's case, which now I'm going to hit home a little bit, the Greyhound race dog case. Dog race gambling activity rose to the level of a trader business because of how much time he devoted to it, the research he did, he was at the track. So the Supreme Court felt that that was a trader business because the manner in which he devoted to the activity. Well, when we look at the oceanographer, how much time is he spending at his full-time gig? He took three trips to Europe. Um, he tried to take all the expenses of his trip. So it was a more of a vacation mixed in with photography. To me, when we go through all those factors, the manner in which he conducted the activity, yes, he kept the expenses, but he, did he do anything 
to learn from it, to make money. Were the expenses and the income from the activity, how were they relative to his salary of 120000 the financial status of the taxpayer? It was clearly a love of labor. It was, it was something recreational. So the court and the IRS, the IRS first ruled that it was a hobby and the court agreed. So curious to see what you thought. So here's a safe harbor that's important. If the activity, so if we're deemed a hobby, we can come back with this, this it's called a rebuttable presumption. If the activity is profitable for three or more of the last five taxable years, such activity shall be presumed for the current taxable year to be an activity engaged in for profit. We therefore can use Schedule C. It'll be treated as a trade or business. In the case of an activity which consists in major part of the breeding, training, showing, or racing of horses, the preceding sentence shall should be applied to substituting two for three, okay, and four for five, okay. So what are our key takeaways from today? Freelance activities must be shown to be at the level of a trade or business so that ordinary uh, and necessary business expenses can be deducted. A real purpose, a real intent to earn a profit must be objectively demonstrated. Again, as an example, it's not just enough to keep records. You have to use them. You have to seek uh, advice of experts. Okay. Seeking the advice of experts has become a very, very key uh, component to this. It's okay to have a love for it. If you want a love for it, as I said before, you just want to be able to demonstrate that um, you did it to make a profit. It wasn't the love that was driving it. It was the money that was driving it. And that's what the IRS wants to see. So hopefully this tied together everything uh, for you. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. Take care. Have a great rest of the day or evening. If it's late night, get a good night's sleep and um, make tomorrow an even better day. Take care.